Thank you, Annie. <clears throat> so Sherry and I have been gone a couple of weeks, and, and I come back, and there are new people here. I, I think that's really cool. You're not new. <laughs> that, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have been going through uh, the book of 1 John, taking it just a little section at a time. And today we are in uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. So if you have your Bibles, your phones, your iPads, uh, whatever they may be, um, that's where we're going to go. By the way, my name is Dan, Dan O'Donnell. I am one of the elders here. Um, I was telling the Lord last night, because we have been gone a couple of weeks, and so it's been a, a little bit of time since I've got to play the bass, and it's been a little while since I got to preach. And I told the Lord, I said, wow, I get to do both. I get to do both. How exciting. And it really is. Um, those of you who have ever taught or done any preaching regularly uh, understand how, how it can be nerve-wracking as you're getting ready. Um, and I, I told the Lord last night, I said, there's, <laughs> there's no reason to get anxious about this. So I had a really lousy night sleeping. <laughs> and I, I told him this morning, uh, I said, if, if there's going to be anything good coming out of this, you're going to have to work. And that's always true, isn't it? It's always true. You know, Carlos, you uh, preach and teach at the rescue mission, and I know when you put the, uh, your prayer down, it's that the Spirit of God would work in you. Uh, I know that's true for our uh, Sunday school teachers and, and our Bible teachers throughout uh, the week. Uh, God calls us to do these things. Singing, thank you, Bonnie. Rodney, on the drums. This guy is so faithful, so faithful week after week. What a, what a blessing. And I was wondering if Taylor is back there on the live stream. Thank you. Sherry and I watched the live stream the last two Sundays, and it was very cool. Really appreciate that. So anyway, that's what we've been doing. We're working through uh, the blessings of faith in Jesus. As we have uh, been uh, going through 1 John, John has a, a number of challenges to his readers, and of course that's us. We read regularly these statements that if, then, if, then. Um, for instance, um, chapter 1, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Throughout this letter, John is writing these things. And uh, it is true that in Greek, uh, even in English, the word if can mean since. But I don't believe that that's what's going on here. Uh, John is challenging us. He um, isn't interested in, in calling our faith into question necessarily. But I think of uh, the Apostle Paul's statement at the end of 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. I, I think that's a good thing to do. You know, when I, when I hear a good gospel message, I, I rehearse. What, what is my hope of heaven? Is it because I have an earned doctorate and I've been pastoring for 40 years? No, my hope of heaven is that and the one who's resurrected. That's my confidence in heaven. Uh, I, I like to re-examine that. And then from time to time, 
and I probably haven't done it recently, and I should, I, I would go through the fruit of the Spirit and say, okay, Lord, what do we need to be working on? Because while I am confident in my relationship with the Lord, I know also there are things that we need to work on. And I think that that's one of the things that John is doing here. Uh, he uses basically three tests. One, the test of love, loving your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, the second one is what you believe about Jesus. Jesus was more than just a man. He was the creator of the universe, the second person of the triune God come in flesh. There were people who were denying that reality, and Jim has talked about that a little bit. Um, and, and then there's this, what do we do about sin in our lives? And John is kind of giving us a, an overall glimpse of what it means to be a believer. We, um, I like to do this. We uh, went to Rogue Roasters a couple of days ago, and uh, the young man that was serving us was wearing a cross. And I do this anytime I have an opportunity. I say, so, you're wearing a cross. Are, are you a follower of Jesus? And he said, yep. And, and it's just cool to hear that. Um, we have some really good churches here in the valley. And uh, I am delighted to hear that we have uh, people who profess to be followers of Jesus. John is saying basically in, in his first letter here, here's what true Christianity looks like. Now, I know you haven't gotten it perfected. Paul says, I haven't gotten it perfected. But we keep pressing on. We keep moving forward, keep moving forward. That's what the Christian life is about. And that's basically, I think, one, one of the things that John is doing here is just painting a picture of what the Christian life looks like. He's not trying to undermine our faith, but give us reasons why we should be confident in our relationship with God. As uh, one commentator said, in the light of all the warnings John gave in chapter f 1, verse 5 through 2, 21, in light of all the warnings John gave, his writers might think that he was fundamentally dissatisfied with their spiritual conditions, that he was really ragging on them. But that's not so. Right here in, in, it's not quite the middle, but maybe a third of the way through, John takes these three verses to encourage us in our relationship with the Lord, to help us understand what that means, even in light of all the challenges he's put here. They're all, if we're reading the scriptures, we're always being challenged, Right? And we look at it and we say, oh, okay, I, like I mentioned, fruit of the Spirit. I don't quite have all of those together. Uh, <laughs> I'm not jovial Bob, and I've always wor uh, wrestled with the uh, fruit of, of joy. You know, you, I'm faithful. I'm trustworthy. You give me a job to do, I'll do it, and I'll be faithful doing it. Joy, it's not so much there all the time. And so... <laughs> Actually, I watch my wife, and then I see, okay, that's what joy looks like. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, anyway, that's where we're going. The blessings of faith in Jesus. Um, John wants us to be encouraged of our relationship with the Lord. And so this leads us to our big idea. As we understand the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus... We grow in confident assurance of our relationship with God. As we understand these things, as we rehearse them, um, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, basically he lists off all of these uh, qualities of, of biblical Christianity. And he says, 
I, I know you know these things. I'm just here to remind you. And when I was a, a very young preacher, my very first church meeting in a home, uh, I had people who had been believers longer than I had been alive. And I thought, what, what, I've been saved three years and I had one year of Bible school and I thought, what do I have to tell these people? And the Lord took me to 2 Peter chapter 1 and said, just, just remind them. That's what we're doing here. We're just getting a refreshment, a reminder of uh, what it means to be a believer, what God is challenging us to do as, as great-grandparents, as grandparents, as parents, as teenagers, what the Lord wants of people who follow him. And so as we understand these blessings and we rehearse them in our hearts and minds, Our relationship with God encourages us, I believe, all the more to live for him day by day. And I think of the song, day by day. <clears throat> anyway, to, to listen, to live for him and also to pray for opportunities to share. He's, he's a good God. He's a good, good God. He so loved the world that he did this for us. He's a good God. And uh, we, we have opportunity from time to time to share that reality with people. And when we understand the depth of what God has done for us in Christ, I think that makes us a little, gives us a little more courage to go ahead and share this with people. And we understand some people don't like it uh, and they won't respond positively. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be advertising him as we should. And when we have this sense of confidence in our own relationship with him, we can be doing that. Okay, so all that is prelude. Uh, get into chapter 2, verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Father, thank you for uh, these words of encouragement. And uh, I pray that as, as we look at this stuff together, uh, that uh, you would encourage our hearts. Give us this confident assurance. I think of the old hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Help us to realize that so that when we get up in the morning, we want more of Jesus. And as we go through the day, we want more of Jesus. And as we lie down at night, we want more of Jesus. Because to know him, to know you, is the essence of eternal life. So may your spirit encourage us for Jesus' sake. Amen. You notice as we go through here, <clears throat> he's writing to three groups of people little children, fathers, and young men. Now, we understand that fathers is a generic term, and it's talking about uh, men and women, and younger men is talking about young men and young women. We want to get that cleared up so uh, that we understand that uh, uh, John is not picking out a certain group of people. But I understand that when he says, I'm writing you to writing to you little children, he's not talking about kids. He's talking about believers. He's talking about all believers. Look over in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you. Several times he calls them my little children. Now part of that could be because John's really old. He's writing this somewhere in the 90s. 
Well, Jesus was doing his ministry 30 to 33. So John has been alive another 60 years. This guy's elderly. We don't like the term old anymore. Elderly is, is what we want to be. Because the older I get, the more I want to be just elderly. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, he's, um, he's writing to all believers, telling them that these things are true to them. And what things are true? First of all, our sins are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven. And it's up there somewhere. There it is. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not making fun. It's, 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 it's a challenge to put this stuff together. Uh, I remember when, this is really telling my age, I remember when I first started working with PowerPoint. Uh, and it was a, a real amazing challenge, and it still is. Anyway, Ellie, thank you for being there. I appreciate it so much. Our sins are forgiven. What is John talking about here? Well, we can't have a relationship with the creator unless we take care of the sin issue. Uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, everybody. That means you and you and you and you and me and everybody out there. Since Adam and Eve fell, all humanity is born into sin. That's the reality all have sinned and come short of, what's it mean, the glory of God? Short of his, his standard, his holiness. I was talking to a, a young brother <clears throat> yesterday and we were talking about what a challenge it is in our minds to bring together God's love and his holiness, his gentleness and his justice. But he is all those things all the time, and they are the reality. But this sin thing has to be dealt with. Why? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. And he, certainly there's the reality of physical death, because he told Adam, you partake of that, and you're going to die. Well, he partook of it and didn't physically die yet. But there was a separation that settled in between them and their creator. And that has been passed down to us. You say, that's not fair. I'm sorry. Uh, it may not seem fair to us, but it's the reality of what the Bible says. You, you look at uh, uh, Romans chapter 3 there, and, and Paul takes several statements out of the Psalms and just showing how clearly God has said, everyone is under this curse of sin and the only out is what God does to rescue us I've always liked that word to rescue because that's what he is doing now we're going to see if and we are we're going to see in the next couple of verses that there's uh, more to there's more to salvation than just having our sins forgiven, and I'm not playing that down because we don't have a relationship with God unless our sins are forgiven. Think about the religions of the world. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Think of some of the cults that are very prevalent, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. You won't find forgiveness there. You just will not. Um, what you will find in, in those religions is that we are trying to work our way into God's favor. <laughs> If you have put your faith in Jesus, you already are in God's favor. Amen? Yeah, that is, that is so cool. And that's one of the things that John wants us to understand. And he says here that our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Um, speaking of Jesus, because your sins are forgiven for his 
name's sake. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the fact that Jesus has won the day for us. That when Jesus is on that cross and cries, it is finished, he's not talking about his earthly life. He's saying, it is accomplished. The reason that I came to rescue fallen humanity has been accomplished. And that's why Paul, can, in his writings, over and over can say, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You will be forgiven of your sins for his name's sake. Um, Matthew 1.21 the angel tells Joseph, and uh, uh, Mary was also told this, but tells Joseph his name will be called Jesus because it is he who will save his people from their sins. So he comes into the world that way. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Um, uh, I said Luke. Acts, thank you. Acts chapter 4, there we go. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. He's talking about talking to the religious leaders there, Peter is, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, not Buddha, not Muhammad, uh, not Hare Krishna. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which, which we must be saved. There is no, Jesus says it, doesn't he? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay, that's pretty clear. We're accused of being narrow-minded. Jesus was narrow-minded. And that's why we are, because there is no way into, his, into a relationship with the Father except through faith in Jesus. And then we see that in uh, 1 John there, back in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone does sin, I appreciate John putting that in there because he knows that it will happen. We don't want to, but he knows it will happen. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, that is his satisfactory sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why Jesus came, to rescue us from that fallen condition. <clears throat> but there's more. There really is more. Like I said earlier, uh, forgiveness of sins... You, that has to be dealt with. But once it is dealt with, we can move on to the Christian life that God has for us. <clears throat> the enemy likes to remind us of our past sins, doesn't he? It's amazing how often that comes. What do I do with that? Jesus paid for that. I have things back there when I was a teenager that I seriously regret. I don't need to wallow around in that, though, because it's forgiven. Well, what about the sins that I'm going to? commit <clears throat> you know what they're already paid for so if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord that's the wrong verse uh, <clears throat> so uh, if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so we do have a rescuer who will take care of us okay thirdly moving right along here uh, he's still speaking to little children, and so I've, I've put that together. We pick it up down in uh, verse 13 at the very end. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. So this is what we have. We have uh, our sins are forgiven for Jesus' name's sake, and we know the Father. This is a very important statement because people in general will say, well, we're all God's children. 
In fact, I just heard that last night on some TV show. We're all God's children. Well, we're all God's creation. We're not all God's children. Next green. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul is in Athens there in chapter 17 of Acts. And there's idols all over the place. And uh, Paul does make the statement that we are God's offspring. What he means is that humanity is basically created by the creator. We have life because he gives us life. But not everyone are, is a child of God. Paul says in Galatians 3.26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So there is a, there is a distinction and I'm not always sure, I'm not always sure how, how, to, how to verbalize that to people. You ever had anybody say to you, well, I, I, I know some Christians who are a lot worse than that person who is not a Christian. Shame on me for being worse than that person who is not a Christian. But I'm not a child of God because of the fact that I am his creation. I'm a child of God because of the fact of what Jesus did for me. And if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts, God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Now you understand why Paul could say, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus. The jailer said, sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Whoa, really? Sins are forgiven. Uh, and he prayed about the Spirit of God who lives within us. Uh, Louis Sperry Chafer, one of the founders of, of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, has a, I think it's like a seven, eight, nine volume set on uh, Christian theology. But in the area of salvation, he notes, I think it's 33 points of divine grace that happen to you at the moment when you accept Christ. Now, I don't have them all memorized, but what he is doing is saying that there's a whole lot of stuff going on when I accept Christ as my Savior. I am born into the family of God. I become a child of God. My sins are forgiven. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You now are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though... We were watching on live stream. It's not the same being here and looking at your face. Because we're brothers and sisters. This is one of the things that God has done for us in Christ. And he's our dad. And we need to be careful that we need to remember we're talking about God here. We're talking about the king of the universe we're talking about that one who is who is so intensely uh, brilliant that we can't even look upon him. So we don't want to forget that. I have to assume that Prince Charles had ready access to his mom, Queen Elizabeth, but she still was the queen. Uh, so we need to be careful, uh, and I'm not watering that down. Uh, Paul says, we say, Abba, Father. And that word is, it, I believe, is an Aramaic word. that It means something real personal. Um, because we have that relationship with God, with God through faith in Jesus. Okay, so our sins are forgiven uh, based on Jesus' name, what he has done for us. We know God as our Father, as little children, as believers. Okay, we move to mature believers. Now, who, who are these? It's interesting to 
study through the commentaries on this and, and see how many options there are in some of these uh, words and phrases. I was reading through uh, Colossians in my devotions here a couple of days ago, and Paul makes the statement that his, his ministry is not only to bring pe people to faith in Christ, but to see them maturing in Christ. And I thought, okay, that's, that's what John is saying. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Who does he mean by fathers? Is he talking about the elderly? Well, it can be. But I am convinced that he's talking about spiritual maturity. You can be a young person and be a very mature Christian. And you can be an elderly Christian and be a very immature. The, uh, one of the churches that, that we attended when we were young believers, we had a fairly elderly congregation, most of whom from my ignorance of Christianity, I thought, these people don't know what Christianity is all about. They were not maturing. I assume... I assume that you're here on Sunday mornings because you want to grow in your relationship with the Lord, you want to grow in your relationship with one another, and you want to uh, grow in your understanding of worship and that sort of thing. In other words, you want to mature. Is there a line that can we draw we can draw? You know, and I can go down, can I go, can I do this? And we go up to Jay and we say, okay, Jay, here's the line. Once you cross it, then you're mature. No line. <laughs> there is no line. You're absolutely right. Uh, how do you know? Well, you look at Scripture. What does, how does Scripture describe a believer? Well, I look at first. First John, and I see some descriptions there. I read Second Peter, and I read some descriptions there. And then I look at it, and I say, okay, Dan, how we doing? I've been walking with the Lord. It's going on 50 years now. And I'm only six years old when I came in. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, How do we know when we are mature? Uh, because there was a, there was a time, uh, I was pastoring in the San Fernando Valley, and this whole thing of churches figuring out their mission statement and their purpose statement and all of this was, was really big, and I never could figure it out myself. Uh, but the question comes up, what, what does a, a mature believer look like? Well, we have to study Scripture and take a look at it. And we could list the things. I think for the most part, and this is just thinking right now, that we're just continually growing in our relationship with the Lord. When uh, Sherry and I moved to Cave Junction in 1973, uh, we had both been raised in church. Um, neither one of us had a, a committed relationship with Christ. Um, but we'd been raised. We, you know, I'd always believed there was a God. I always believed the Bible was the Word of God. I always believed Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he was raised again because that's what it was taught, but I wasn't living it. And then on the, f and some of you have heard this story, but uh, you'll have to hear it again. Uh, I think it was the fourth Sunday. We started attending Community Bible Church there in Cave Junction. And the fourth Sunday, Earl Brubaker, the pastor, had one of his rare invitations. And it was for Dan. And I didn't hear a voice, but I look back at it and I think, you know, it's like God was saying, Dan, you've always known this stuff. It's time you do something about it. And I said, okay. 
And then on we went. And I look back at my life, and, and we understand. We're not talking about perfection here. But I see spiritual growth. I see that taking place. I understand, too. That, you know, sometimes there's a couple steps backwards, and, and we're moving forward. But are you moving forward? That's the issue. It's not that you have it down perfect because you're not going to get it down perfect. But am I growing in my relationship with the Lord? Am I spending time with him? I find that's hard. Some people, it seems like they, they easily fall into a devotional cycle. You know, and they can just, they get up in the morning and they're all, they get their cup of coffee and they get their devotional book and their Bible. And uh, I, I find I have, to, <laughs> I have to do some different things. But can I look at my life? <laughs> can I ask my wife, am I doing better now than I was 10 years ago? She said yes. <laughs> we, should, we should be able to, shouldn't we? We should be able to. And, and there'll be, again, there'll be rocky times, and we recognize that. But we should be able to move forward in that. And, and I need to move forward because that clock keeps ticking. Uh, <clears throat> okay, what does he say about fathers, the mature? Because you know him who is from the beginning. Verse 14, because you know him who is from the beginning. Isn't that interesting? He just repeats what he said. I think what he's telling us is that there's nothing more than you can, you can do but grow in your knowledge of Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what else can I do? Well, continue growing. Continue getting to know Jesus. I want to know you. Jesus, my Lord. And I said this, I think, the last time I preached here. Uh, my prayer is I want to want to know you. I want that to be a goal in my heart and my life. It's not always, unfortunately, but I, I want it to be there, and I, I think it's becoming more and more. Uh, that's an interesting statement, though, to, to my thinking. I'm writing to your father, this is verse 13, because you know him, who is from the beginning. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Who is he talking about? Well, here we get into the uh, discussions in the commentaries. I think he's talking about Jesus uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that he has said, I write to you children because you know the father. And so he's writing to the fathers because you know him who is from the beginning and certainly could be talking about God the Father. But then I think of, this is John writing this. How does John begin his gospel? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. What is he telling us? When we look at him who was in the beginning, it's, not just an abstract re reality. It is the person of Jesus before he was Jesus. That makes sense? He, he became Jesus with the name. He was the word of God from the beginning. And so I think that that's what he's saying to them. He's saying, fathers, you have this close relationship with the Savior. Keep growing in it. Keep growing in it. Keep growing in it. I'm uh, thinking of some of our young families looking out here at the Dados and I love you guys. And the Christiansons are back there and, and uh, the Pattons are back there. And what does Scripture tell you to do with your kids? 
train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What is Paul saying? We want you, you as parents, to grow your kids so that they will love Jesus. You know what that's going to mean? You're growing in your love for Jesus because they will see it. They will see whether it's true or not. I'm just looking at this. I, I, I really am in here thinking, uh, really, uh, what, uh, where we need to go here. Uh, I need to go to, uh, let's see, we said, uh, we know him who is from the beginning. Okay, we can add nothing to a growing knowledge of Jesus and fur further knowledge. And then the next one is knowing God is the greatest goal we have, the supreme achievement in life. Okay, and then I have Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, which is one of my favorite sections of the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the man, mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Okay, these are things that the world chases after, right? That's not your goal. But let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me. That he understands and knows me. And so Jesus in his, what we call his high priestly prayer, says this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know him, to know him, to know him. That is what maturing looks like in the Christian life. Uh, do I know him better today than I did five years ago? Is my walk with him closer today than it was uh, 10 years ago? It, it, do I see that working? Uh, and, you know, and it, kind of jokingly, I asked my wife, but that's not a bad idea. Husbands and wives, it's not a bad idea. You know, we're to be growing together, right? So it's not a bad idea, Elizabeth, for you to look at Justinian and say, okay, honey, how am I doing in my walk with the Lord? And vice versa, okay? You get to ask her, too, and she gets to tell you. Uh, I, I think that's valuable. How am I doing? Uh, this woman here is the closest one who knows me better than anybody but Jesus. And... Uh, <clears throat> We have this mutual relationship. How's Bonnie doing? Don't tell me. <laughs> Maturing. We should be able to look back and say, okay, we understand that. Okay, moving right along to young believers. Um, in the writing, uh, the end of verse 13, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then he says, I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. There's this battle for the souls of men and women, boys and girls. Thank you to all of you who worked on that VBS that was so cool to see these kids having fun, yeah. Although that song where they jumped and turned around, I'd hurt myself. And <clears throat> they were having fun. I pray for the Christian uh, youth in action. They are the young people leaders that do this kind of stuff. And, and uh, like Karen, I think it was Karen that said that they're going to be doing it for the next three weeks. Too. But to watch them minister to these kids and hear that some of these kids have come to faith in Christ or been built up in that relationship. That's how I pray for our, uh, our Sunday school program, our teachers, uh, that they would see fruit in their ministry as they... 
minister. See fruit in their ministry as their minister. That's kind of redundant. But anyway, that they would see fruit in, in what they're doing for the Lord. And John says, they have victory over Satan. Sometimes we, we play games with Satan. Uh, we sing silly little songs about him. He's our arch enemy. He was the serpent in the garden, according to Revelation. He desires our destruction. And in Christ, we have victory over him. Now, he can still play games. And he does, doesn't he? He, he whoops up on us. Um, when I said yes to Jesus... In effect, Jesus says, this one's mine. We used to have a chorus, a song that we sang. This this one's mine. I belong to him. I don't belong to the forces of darkness anymore. Now, does that mean that I'm free from attack? Absolutely not. Uh, Peter warns us, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is walking around looking for somebody that he can chew up. There is a battle going on. It's a battle for the the souls of men and women, boys and girls. It's a reality. When we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, we have set, set the trying to think of something, set the train on the tracks and it's moving. That's, that's kind of a dumb. Uh, <clears throat> what? Get the ball rolling. Thank you. That, that makes me think of bowling. You know? <laughs> uh, thanks, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, but we need to realize that there is this spiritual battle that's taking place. Uh, I remember one young woman in our church down in San Fernando Valley. She said, you know, this, this Christian thing is tough. And I could tell why, because she was, she was just under attack. But she said, you know, before I was a believer, if I was having problems, I'd just go get stoned. Go get drunk and forget it. But then you wake up the next morning and you got the same stuff going on. It is hard being a Christian. But listen to what John says to the youngest of believers. Victory is yours in Christ. Yes, uh, we, uh, our battle isn't against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, and and we understand those things. And it's tough. Um, I I read uh, and and pray regularly uh, through the Voice of the Martyrs Martyrs magazine. Satan is on the attack against so many of our brothers and sisters. Nigeria is a mess. In China, they're harvesting organs from live people. Satan is at work. And we need to, we need to understand what a challenge that is because you can't overcome him on your own. But you're not on your own. And so that's what John <clears throat> kind of concludes here. He says uh, in verse 13, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then he says in the end of uh, verse 14, I write to to you, young men, because you are strong. How? And the word of God abides in you. 
and you have overcome the evil one. I think those two statements work together. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. <clears throat> what is my main weapon against the enemy? Yeah. And it's not just quoting it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, take that out of context and make it mean whatever you want. Um, I had a, have a sister who uh, tends to be quite anxious. And I suggested to her one time, I said, go to Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to God. Okay, I said, take a three-by-five card and write that out. And when you start getting anxious, take it out. Don't just read it, but do it. It says, with thanksgiving. So I'm going to spend a little time thanking God for who he is and what that means in my life. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to respond to this word. It's always been interesting to me as a, as a preacher that sometimes people would uh, go out and after a sermon, after worship service, and they say, wow, Dan, that particular point really struck me. And I'm thinking, okay, that was a side issue that just popped into my head. But it was always, always encouraging to know that somebody had taken something that I had the privilege of sharing, and it is, it's a privilege and it's a delight, had taken it and put it to work in their life. Because that's how the evil one is overcome. That's what Paul, or Paul, John is saying here. Through the indwelling word of God, we have victory over the evil one. Take a look at the uh, whole armor of God, and that'll give you a, an insight in the victory that we can have in Christ. Well, I know we, and this happens almost in every sermon, we spend more time on the first point and then a little less in the second point. And, right, Ben? Yeah, and then you get to the third point and you say, ah, I'm only two-thirds of the way through. Well, okay, we are done. The big idea, as we understand the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus, we grow in confident assurance of our relationship with God, which encourages us all the more to live for him uh, day by day. Uh, one of our pastor and wives regionals there was a, a simple little probably a, like a, a, a spiritual song and said in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have all this world but give me Jesus. You know, I think if we started the day like that, reminding ourselves of what we have in Christ, what he has done for us, I think we would see some real maturing taking place. And so my challenge to us is take it home. Listen to it. Study it. Find out who Jesus is. Find out what he has done for us. <clears throat> and then live it to his honor and glory. Father, we realize that there's, there's so much that can be done in just a few verses of your word. But would you take these things home to us in our hearts and minds that we would rejoice in what we have as your little children as maturing believers, as new believers, we have this growing relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, and love to us. In Jesus' name, amen.